Greetings students and welcome back to another video on calculus of variations. In this video we're going to talk about the Euler-Lagrange equation and several dependent variables. And then we're going to move on to discuss how calculus of variations works in the presence of constraints. So let's start with the Euler-Lagrange equation and several dependent variables. Suppose I had a functional i which consisted of an integral from x equals x1 to x equals x2 of capital F which was an expression involving x, y1, y1 prime, y2, y2 prime, all the way to yn and yn prime. In other words, instead of having just one dependent variable y and its derivative y prime, I now have n dependent variables as well as each of their first derivatives. My goal here is to derive an equation that gives the stationary functions the stationary y's of the functional i. In other words, I'd like to derive the Euler-Lagrange equation for multiple dependent variables. The procedure for this is very similar to the procedure I used when deriving the original Euler-Lagrange equation in a previous video, links in the description. Because I've already done this before, I'm not going to discuss everything in excruciating detail this time around. Now, in addition to finding the functions yi that make the functional stationary, our functions yi also need to obey the boundary conditions. So yi at x equals x1 equals yi1, and yi at x equals x2 equals yi2. Of course, these boundary conditions apply to all dependent variables from y1 to yn, which is why my i ranges from 1 to n. So let's start the derivation by supposing that yi represents the functions that make the functional i stationary. Now what we're going to do is introduce a function e dot i of x with the only condition that it must be zero at the boundaries x1 and x2. Otherwise e dot i is just a completely random function. Anyway, what we're going to do is define a new function yi bar given by our extremal yi, our stationary function, plus some parameter epsilon i times the arbitrary function e dot i. Essentially, yi bar represents a variation in the extremal yi, and because e dot i is an arbitrary function, you can conclude that by extension, yi bar can also represent any arbitrary function. The only restriction on yi bar arises from the restrictions we put on yi and e dot i earlier on, related to the boundary conditions. Now because of the parameter epsilon and the arbitrary function eta, this yi bar can be interpreted as representing a whole family of curves. Now what I want to do is find the particular yi in this family that makes our functional i stationary. Notice that this quantity i depends only on the parameter epsilon i. Why is that? Well, because the x gets integrated out from this definite integral, which means that once you integrate and apply your limits to end up with the functional, the only parameter or variable remaining in the final expression is the epsilon i. Now, my primary objective here is to make the functional i stationary, but since capital I only depends on epsilon i, Making the functional stationary is equivalent to setting d capital I d epsilon I equal to zero. It's like single variable calculus, if you want a function to be stationary, just set its derivative to zero. But we already know what the value of epsilon I is that corresponds to a stationary I, and that's epsilon I equals zero. Remember, the function y i of x was already assumed to be stationary beforehand, and so it's easy to see that when epsilon I is zero, the particular curve we end up for yi bar is our desired function yi. All right, so what we're going to do is use this fact that di d epsilon i is zero at epsilon equals zero. We're going to use this fact to differentiate the integral expression for capital I, then do some algebra, and then arrive at the Euler-Lagrange equation for several dependent variables. Now when the derivative of capital I with respect to epsilon i is zero, then the derivative of this whole integral with respect to epsilon i is also zero. Obviously because capital I equals this integral by definition. Now let's move the derivative inside, in which case we'll get a partial derivative with respect to epsilon i. Y i bar and Y i bar prime are the only variables inside capital F which actually depend on epsilon i if you look inside this integral. X is just an independent variable y itself, while the other y's that don't have the index i 
don't depend on epsilon i. They have their own variation, their own family of curves. So what we can do is apply the chain rule of partial differentiation to end up with the following. Again, the partial derivatives of x with respect to epsilon i and the partial derivatives of all the other y bars with respect to epsilon i are zero. That's why they're not here. Now, if we go back to the expression for y i bar, we can easily see that its partial derivative with respect to epsilon i is eta i. And we can also infer that the partial derivative of y i bar is eta i prime. Let's take these and put them back into our expression for d capital I d epsilon i down here. Now let's simplify further. We'll take the second term in this integral and integrate it by parts separately. I'm not going to go over all the steps, but when you do perform integration by parts with your eta i prime as your second function and your partial f partial y i bar prime as your first function, here's what you'll get. Now we know from the boundary conditions on eta i that at both x1 and x2, eta i is just zero. So we'll cancel out the second term and if we do that, we'll end up with the following. We can take eta i common and end up with a factored expression for the integral. Now let's look at this. When epsilon i is zero, y i bar is just equal to y i by the definition of y i bar. And we'll end up with the simplified expression for d capital I d epsilon when we apply the fact that epsilon I is zero. Now, if e dot I is an arbitrary function, then the only way this integral is guaranteed to be zero is if partial f partial y i minus the derivative with respect to x of partial capital F partial y i prime is zero. This is the Euler-Lagrange equation for multiple dependent variables. So in order to determine the y's that make this functional stationary, we need to solve these Euler-Lagrange equations. But instead of solving just one Euler-Lagrange equation to find a single function which makes capital I stationary, we have to solve n Euler-Lagrange equations to find the combination of n functions which makes capital I stationary where there's one Euler-Lagrange equation for each dependent variable yi. So we'll have an Euler-Lagrange equation for y1. We'll have another Euler-Lagrange equation for y2. And this will keep going all the way to the Euler-Lagrange equation for yn. We have to solve all those Euler-Lagrange equations to find the stationary set of functions which makes capital I stationary. And this is how we use the Euler-Lagrange equation to solve a calculus of variations problem when there are multiple dependent variables involved. Let's now move on to the second topic for this video, which is about constrained variation. Suppose I had a functional given by the integral from x1 to x2 of capital F of x, y, and y prime dx. Now we've moved back to a single dependent variable here. My objective with this functional is to find the function y, which makes this functional stationary. We already know how to do that, just use the Euler-Lagrange equation straight up. But what if there's an additional twist to this problem? What if there's an additional condition on the desired function y, which says that the integral from x1 to x2, so an integral over the same limit, of g of x, y, and y prime must equal some constant that's known beforehand. So now, instead of just blindly solving the regular Euler-Lagrange equation on the functional capital I, we now have to solve the Euler-Lagrange equation in the presence of this condition or this constraint, that the integral from x1 to x2 of capital G of x, y, y prime must be a fixed constant. By the way, I'm going to call this constraint integral J. So how do we find the stationary function of the functional capital I subject to the constraint that the functional capital J must be held constant at some fixed value? Well, we use the techniques of constrained variation. And these techniques basically just involve Lagrange multipliers. For our purposes, you don't need to know the theory behind Lagrange multipliers, just how they work. And the idea is that in order to solve this constrained calculus of variations problem, we construct a new functional called k, which is i plus lambda j. Lambda over here is an unknown constant that's called the Lagrange multiplier. So if I substitute the integrals for capital I and capital J, I'll find that capital K equals the integral from x1 to x2 of capital F dx plus lambda times the integral from x1 to x2 of capital G dx. 
Now the intuition behind this constructed functional is that it takes into account both the original functional that you're trying to make stationary and the constraint integral. So it's practically built to kill both birds with one stone. It takes into account everything you need to solve the calculus of variations problem in one neat package. Now what we do with this constructed functional once we've constructed it is directly apply the Euler-Lagrange equation to it. That's all there is. We construct this functional and apply the Euler-Lagrange equation. So we'll take the partial with respect to y of capital F plus lambda g minus the derivative with respect to x of partial partial y prime of capital F plus lambda g and set that equal to zero. Of course, we can expand this out and simplify a little, in which case we'll get the following Euler-Lagrange equation for constrained variation. So this constrained variation business is relatively simple when there's one constraint. All you do is you take the functional that you want to optimize, that's capital I, add that to an unknown constant lambda times your constraint integral j, and once you've added them together, you just apply the Euler-Lagrange equation on that combined package to get your desired function y. Now, a question might arise from all this constrained variation business. What if there's more than one constraint? So, for instance, what if I had n constraints? What if, in addition to finding the stationary function of capital I, I needed my optimal function y to satisfy a whole bunch of constraints given by these n integrals from j1 all the way to jn? In that case, the procedure is pretty similar to what I need to do with one constraint. Once again, I'll construct a new functional capital K, but instead of making it i plus lambda j, I'll just make it i plus lambda 1 j1 plus lambda 2 j2 all the way to lambda n j n. So I'll include all of these constraints in my functional capital K. Another way to write this would be to use summation notation, in which case our constructed functional would be K equals capital I plus the sum from 1 to N of lambda I times J I. Again, to solve this multiple constraint problem, we just straight up apply the Euler-Lagrange equation to this constructed functional capital K in order to solve this problem. So the procedure is very similar to what you would do when there's only one constraint. Anyway, that does it for this video. In the next lesson, we're actually going to give some context to this constrained variation business by solving a real physics problem where we'll use constrained variation to derive the equation of a catenary. So some really exciting stuff coming up. I'm sure you're all drooling at the mouth to see that next lesson. I'll finish off by thanking the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher. I've linked my Patreon account in the description so you can check it out. And that's it. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.